Our first reading for today comes out of Revelation, and it's uh, just two verses in that section. It's in chapter 14, 12 and verses 12 and 13. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commands and remain faithful to Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. The second lesson up there is from 2 Timothy, again a very short section, but 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. Paul is writing this and he says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only me, but also all who have longed for his appearing. The last one comes out of the Gospel of Luke, and it's that little section, if you look up there, chapter 18, starting at verse 9. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. People were also bringing babies to Jesus to have him touch them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the children to him, and he said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. So I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter into it. Here ends the readings. And I would like the little children to come down, if you would. (coughs) How are you guys? Keep coming. Come on, keep coming. So good to see you all. Did you notice the one thing that I read was for little children and about little children? And the Bible was telling you, and God was telling you in his word, how important you are. And sometimes we think, oh, they're just a little kid. What can they do? And God never looks at you that way. God sees you, and he says, if you can't learn to love me like a little child learns to love me, if you can't learn to respond the way a little child does, then you're going to miss out on the heaven that I have for you. And so Jesus said to you guys, he said, the rest of you stay there. I want the kids up. And he put you on his knee, put his arm around you, and he blessed you. And he wanted you to know that's how special you are. Sometimes the world and people tell us we're not special, whether we're little or we're big. And sometimes we've got to learn that Jesus whispers to you, there's nobody like you in the whole world. And God wants you in heaven with him. So in my sermon today, we're going to be talking a little bit about that. And we're going to be talking about something else, which is how important What you do as a little child matters to you even as you get older. When I was little like you and I had to sit with my mom and dad, they liked to bring me down toward the front. Can you guess why? 
I behaved better. But I did something else. I listened to the pastor. And so in the church that I would go to when I was little like you, I would sit by my mom and dad, and the pastor would say, are we happy today? And does God love you today? And I started answering all the questions. Yes, I am. And I am happy, and I'm glad Jesus loves me. And my mother's going, mm. she got worried. She thought, you're not supposed to talk like that in church. So when we left church that day, because I didn't stop talking, go figure. When we left church that day, my mother goes, <coughs> I hope my son didn't bother you too much while you were preaching your sermon. You know what the pastor said? He said, oh, no. He said, I know he was listening, and I wish everybody else would have been saying an amen and answering the questions too. And so my mom did not get upset with me, and she did not yell at me, and in fact, the pastor told me when I was little like you, what you say matters. And even as an old guy, I can remember that when I was little like you. So I want you to remember something. No matter how little or big we are, that's how important we are to God. And hopefully pastors, including me, will allow you to be the child that God has brought into his kingdom. Because no matter what, God wants all of us in his kingdom with him. Can you remember that for the sermon today? Yes. Wonderful. I'm going to go over here, and I've got my heroic uh, elder on duty. I see that. There you go. Ladies first. Go, ladies, go. You guys are getting really good at waiting. Duty, tooty. Duty. What's duty? duty? You're welcome, honey. Duty, duty, duty. Duty, duty, duty. I guess so. All right, boys, go get it. You're welcome, honey. You're welcome. I'm going to ask Connie to come up at this time because I want her to share with you the ministry and message of uh, the, the whole sequence of everything she does. I don't know how long she's going to talk, but I'll, li I'll limit myself. You go right ahead. You take whatever time the Lord asks you to take. Nope, it don't, it'll... They didn't turn it on. Um, so Eyewitness for Life has been around for nearly 30 years. And what we do is help women considering abortion by giving them a free ultrasound. Um, when they see the ultrasound, it really um, brings the truth of what's happening, makes a pregnancy a baby. Um, and 85% of the time, they will change their minds. Um, all the clients who we serve are considering an abortion. So um, there are many help centers in our area. We actually are quite blessed in the Milwaukee area to have all sorts of um, help centers, um, which provide different types of services to women. Um, we focus just on ultrasound and that really early decision-making moment. Um, most women are making a decision about their pregnancy. I mean, we've gotten people who call like from the bathroom with a pregnancy test stick. And they are already looking for an abortion. And it's, a, it's kind of a knee-jerk reaction to an unplanned experience. I think we probably all have some type of experience, whether it's an abortion experience or not, of just kind of like problem fix it. <laughs> and um, people are definitely in that frame of mind. And uh, our goal is to reach out to advertise our free service and, and then offer people a free ultrasound. Um, 
can, I can talk for hours about this, but just to kind of summarize it, our goal is to reach women um, and encourage them to have an ultrasound for a couple of reasons. One, we know it will save their baby's life. Um, secondly, abortion is not beneficial for women at all. There's lots of um, post-abortion syndrome, um, anxiety, depression, substance abuse, increased risk of suicide, um, difficulty bonding with future children um, from other pregnancies. Um, most relationships don't continue after an abortion. Um, it, it, it destroys a lot of things. Um, it's not good for women. And physically, obviously, um, women can die, they can hemorrhage, they can have infection, perforated uh, uterus, all sorts of things can happen um, from an abortion. So um, one thing that we really try to emphasize is that the value of life is, um, we believe, inherent from the moment of conception because God created it in his image. And that's why mom's life is just as valuable as her baby's life. And so we really do try to speak to that and encourage women in that way. Um, after their ultrasound, um, they get follow-up with the follow-up coordinator who reaches out um, to try to determine what the next steps should be. Um, sometimes people do not leave the office. So we do I'll back this up to say when they come in before the ultrasound, um, we've already screened them and have determined that they are considering an abortion or being pressured to have one by someone in their life. And we ask them to, this, uh, it's phrased something like, um, in regards to my pregnancy now, um, I might have an abortion. I definitely will have an abortion. I might have an abortion. I'm totally undecided. I probably won't have an abortion or I definitely won't. So. There's, we ask them to kind of rate it for us to help us quantify where they are. And then after the ultrasound, they take that same question, answer that again on paper. And we always, almost always see people move toward life. They might not say, I definitely won't have an abortion right at that moment because this short 30 minute appointment has just rocked their world. Like, okay, I thought I needed an abortion now this has made this child, this pregnancy, human to me, and now what? <laughs> They're not necessarily like leaving and going to Target for a car seat. So we follow up with them, determine what does she need. Does she need another ultrasound to kind of solidify what's going on or to further change her mind? Does she need um, adoption resources? Does she need help with material resources such as car seats or other things? Does she need you know, some other kind of support? Does she need help getting insurance or you know, whatever? We do not provide some of that other um, level of stuff, but we do refer to other help centers for that. And some women don't need that. There's, you know, some people are in an okay situation as far as maybe finances or something, but they're in college or um, we've had all different sorts of people come. And we don't ask, it, all of our clients are not poor as you might think. Um, that is definitely a reason people consider abortion, but sometimes it's the relationship or just bad timing or, you know, college or school or uh, career goals, you know, all sorts of things. We've had nurses come in. You'd think they would understand, but really seeing your own baby on an ultrasound, not like in a textbook about fetal development, that makes all, all the difference um, in changing somebody's mind. So I think we have a client testimonial video um, of one of our clients, Atisha. And I will also say all of our videos are on YouTube. So if you search Eyewitness for Life LTD on YouTube, you can see all of them. And I don't know, we have like probably a dozen moms who have shared their story about coming. Um, but here, this is Atisha's story. I think maybe we have it ready. I am 26 weeks and two days pregnant. I was considering terminating the pregnancy because my daughter is 13 and my son is nine. We already have like a routine down packed and adding a new baby into the picture, I thought would kind of be a little bit extreme. This is actually my second time coming to Eyewitness. 
nine years ago when I came, I was actually thinking about a, adoption and I had lost my insurance and I wasn't sure what I was having. And so once I discovered that I was having a boy, it kind of just changed everything. My nine-year-old son name is Rayon and he's a goofball, just a ball of energy. He also attends Spanish Immersion, so he is bilingual. I can't imagine being without my son. He's a, he's a joy. He keeps me going. I volunteer my services here at Eyewitness for Life. It is an organization that invites women in who are pregnant, who are unsure about what they want to do about their pregnancies, and we offer them free ultrasounds. And it just allows our moms to be able to see their baby on the screen and then get the ultrasound that they need. It was important and valuable to come back to Eyewitness because it's kind of where I started off. It helped me make a decision with my son. So I kind of feel like coming back to Eyewitness, it'll help me make a decision with, with this child as well. My decision to terminate, it vanished as soon as I came back to Eyewitness. It was like, that wasn't even a question once I came back here. The people that I see here, when I watch them watching the screen, I can see it the sense of awe when they see their, their baby on the screen moving. A lot of times it's a little bit of surprise, like, that's my baby? It's moving? Is that it? Um, is that really its heartbeat? Is that really its arm or hand? Um, and, and so I think just that awareness is, is helping. Seeing the heartbeat did make a difference because it's kind of was like, okay, yeah, there's a tiny little human being brewing in there. I always love explaining the heartbeat to people because on ultrasound we can see it start beating at around six weeks. Seeing it moving is really what catches our mom's eyes. Witnessing my kids inside the womb, for me, actually just, it kind of just put me in a, the mindset of, okay, I have a, a, another human coming into the world. I have another responsibility and someone else that can look up to me. So today I actually got to see her face. It was, it was exciting. I get to see all the different developmental stages of babies all along the way and growing from um, a couple millimeters and having only little arm buds and wiggling to being, you know, having long arms and legs and um, mouth opening, closing and they're kicking and um, moving all around and it's really fun to see that development from beginning to end. The ultrasound was free, which was wonderful for me and especially our community as well. If you say, hey, I'm gonna put my child up for adoption, no one looks at you different here. So I, I do refer people here just cause it's, it's walking me. You fall in love with the first sight of your child, which is in the womb. So I would like to say thank you to all that do donate. What a good big brother, huh? Two, two lives, Rayon and baby Callie. Um, so that mom, you can just see the difference that seeing her baby made. Like this, an experience happened, she wasn't ready for another baby. Her kid, you know, nine and 13, you know, and then another one, maybe that's a big age gap or whatever um, all of her reasons were. But when she saw him, when she saw the baby again, that, like she says, it vanished, and I just love that because for her, it's very profound, and she was, you know, ready to figure out what to do next. And she's really, she's doing well. She, fortunately, had some complications at, after she gave birth, was in the hospital for a few days, and she's doing okay now. Um, so I'm trying to think if there's anything else I should mention. Just a couple things, maybe regarding Roe v. Wade overturn. Um, that's a great thing. Um, in Wisconsin, abortion is illegal. Um, Unplanned pregnancies are still happening and all the reasons for considering an abortion um, still exist, right? Um, Illinois does thousands and thousands more abortions than what we had here. And now women are traveling over the border um, to have abortions done there. Um, so that, that's what's happening. Um, people can get abortion pills even online um, and sent to them. So. It's still, 
it's still mm-hmm. happening. So the need for <laughs> eyewitness is really no different than before. Um, so we appreciate your support. Um, I think we're going to make some frames later, which is just really a sweet way to just show your love. Um, and also, we covet your prayers. Um, our building um, was vandalized by the Jane's Revenge Group. If you've seen that on the news, um, they've hit places all over the country, and um, we were one of them, unfortunately. Our building, our building, and just really by the grace of God, they got the two other um, companies in our building and not us, even though they were clearly there for us because they put their name on the building, Jane's Revenge. So um, that's why they were there. So if you would um, pray for our safety, um, for our moms, um, our volunteers, um, we would greatly, greatly appreciate that. And I'm here after, so if anyone has questions, um, maybe grab a business card. I did not bring brochures with me. I will mail some or send some with my parents. Um, keep one in your glove compartment. You just never know, you know when you might need to make a referral um, to someone. Thank you, Connie. <clears throat> For what? <laughs> Connie, come here. <laughs> she knows that. Lord, uh, you honor us with uh, quality individuals and quality people that love you with their whole heart and demonstrate that in their own lives and their own families and in the ministries and volunteering that they do. And so I thank you for Connie. I thank you for her testimony today. I thank you for her ministry. I thank you for the children that that ministry has saved and for the parents and women that that has saved also. I pray, Lord, that it would just continue. I pray, Lord, that we would be filled with the enthusiasm that we need to be supportive and encouraging both to her and to uh, those that volunteer in her organization and those that give their time to help save children and women, Lord. Come and bless her, be with her, watch over her, protect her, guard her family and guard her ministry. By the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray this on your name, Jesus. Amen. Thanks, God. One other thing I just want to say. So the sonographer in that video with the long blonde hair, that's Sarah Quaklar. So some of you maybe remember the Quaklar family. Quaklar so remembers here. little blonde girls. That's Sarah Quaklar, all grown up. She's a mom herself. And uh, does ultrasound with eyewitness, so it was a fun connection. <laughs> I taught for 43 years and had the privilege sometimes of hearing stories about some of my kids. I remember the names, but I'm not sharing any of them. But a mother came to me once and met me at a grade school basketball game and said, Hi, Pastor Herman. And uh, she proceeded to tell me this story about her daughter and her boyfriend who graduated high school and the daughter was pregnant. And the mother said, I didn't know what I was going to do. And so I, I said, well, can I at least go with you to the doctor? And uh, she went with the daughter and the boyfriend to the doctor and the doctor was pretty much encouraging the daughter to get an abortion. And uh, <clears throat> she said, I, I was afraid uh, if I said anything, uh, she would go off on me or just go against me just because. Finally, uh, they left the doctor's office, they, and uh, she turned to her daughter and said, can I ask you a question? What, do, what are you going to do with the baby? Are you going to have an abortion? She said, my daughter and her boyfriend at the time said, what are you, crazy? Pastor Harmon would kill us. <laughs> then she reached into her purse. She took out a wallet with a young lady, beautiful young lady, that was just finishing college and a medical degree and saying, this is who was saved because of your ministry. And I'm going, when you get to experience that at any level, and you just kind of go, oh, my Lord, how good you are. And to understand, that's the impact I wanted you to feel this morning.
okay? I want you to understand. The, the verse that was read to you out of uh, Revelation was, this calls for patient endurance because it's tough, all right? Who obey God's commandments and remain faithful. And then I heard this voice from heaven in Revelation says, uh, blessed are those who die in the Lord because they will rest from their labor and their deeds will follow them. All right? And I want you to understand that you don't always get to see the blessing of a donation, of a gift, of a word, of a testimony, of a sharing, of an encouragement to a child, of a pastor looking at my mother and saying, it's okay if he wants to talk to me in the sermon, let him talk. Because it released my mother from normal parent concerns. Like, oh my goodness, my kids. And you begin to understand an old guy remembering back when he was five years old, sitting in his church, talking to the pastor or answering his questions. You begin to understand what was meant. And so I tied that together with that, ta that passage in Timothy, which is a continuation from last Sunday, where Paul says this, I'm being poured out like a drink offering. My life, he literally, he was going to get his head chopped off from all the information that we have. And he said, my life is going to be poured out. You can understand, you get your head chopped off, you bleed out, obviously, among other things and everything else. The time for my departure has come. I fought the good fight. Now, the good fight is the beautiful fight. And there are good fights and there are bad fights. You can usually tell which is which. A husband and wife can have a good fight because they're not the same. And sometimes you have to fight to resolve and get to a conclusion and get to the end of the problem or the situation. But you also know when fights go bad, and you have fought a bad fight. And so in the context, the good fight is that which honors God, that which brings glory to God, that which resolves problems in a way that's beneficial and constructive. And so you begin to understand the significance of what Paul is trying to say. I fought the good fight. He's saying, I'm ready to go. And so I wanted you to put that together and to understand when you have Connie sharing with you, you may not ever meet the people that are serviced by her organization, but to find out even one of the children that grew up in our congregation, one of the Quakler children, is now working and serving, volunteering her talent, her ability, her gifting in the ministry to help save and impact the lives of these babies, obviously, and these women. And you begin to understand that's the, pro the process that we're all in. And we need to recognize that and the beauty of that particular moment. And so when we, when we get to those points, please understand, God says in this section also, he identifies, or he said, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, okay? And by finish, it means completed. I don't know, I had three kids that ran cross country. And cross country is not a fun race to watch, but apparently, if you like running, it's a good race to run. And they have these flags set up. You gotta stay between them and go up and down the hills and through the woods and across the creek. And any place that the cross country path takes you, that's what Paul is saying. He said, I stayed on my path. I didn't quit it when it got tough. I stayed where I needed to be. I have completed the race set in front of me. Okay? I did what God was calling me to do. And then he puts down at the last little one there, he said, I have kept the faith. The faith that was given to him. The faith that was handed down to him the doctrine, all the things connected with the things that Paul learned. I have kept that and I've published it. I've shared it. I've lived it out. And so you begin to understand so many of who things of who you are 
are influenced when you least expect it. I don't think any of us consciously looked at a Quakelar child and said, someday this girl is going to be out there saving babies. And I didn't look at any of my kids coming up here today. But in the back of my mind, the Spirit of God says, respect, encourage, trust. Connie shared, I don't know if she shared this one or before, where she was sitting over here listening to someone talk about the, the ministry of the whole uh, pro-life thing, and she felt the calling and the stroking and the encouragement of the Spirit calling her at that time when she was just young. And eventually, through a whole series of events, got ministered to and called into and encouraged, where now she is ministering her life, her values, her points and understanding out into people around her. And so you begin to understand what God is trying to communicate to us in these times, as he points that out, where he says this at the last point in verse 8, Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. And he goes, you have to understand. And now I'm going to take you back to the Revelation passage, and I want you to listen, and I want you to listen to a person. This I got, Tom Pett happened to read this yesterday in men's study, and I said, Tom, it'd be perfect for what, uh, I want to have in, uh, in my sermon tomorrow. It says this. I'm going to read uh, right from the, the section. It says, from Psalm 71, 18, it says, Even while I am old and gray, God, do not abandon me. While I proclaim your power to another generation, your strength to all who are to come. Our greatest ministry will occur, occur after we're dead. That is, after we're in heaven. We leave behind all the work we've done, the tasks we've completed, the words we've said and written, the people we've touched, the causes we've supported, the lives we've changed, the children we've raised, the churches we sustained, the missionaries we sent, and the funds we've invested in the kingdom. It all has a ripple effect that expands until Christ returns. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. They will rest from their labors since their works follow them. And I thought how appropriate to try and point out to us. I had also the privilege of getting a text from one of the teachers I used to work with at Milwaukee Lutheran. And it wasn't Ryan, but... Uh, there's another one of the teachers there at Milwaukee Lutheran. He says, Bruce, did you notice that Bernard Bull wrote about you? Now, Bernard Bull, brilliant young man, was one of my student teachers. Okay? And uh, I go, uh-oh. Because <laughs> I, I, I helped my student teachers, but I made them learn a lot of different things. But he wrote this unbelievable, beautiful thing about his first day of student teaching. He said, I was all set, and uh, I had spilled something on myself and I had coffee and whatever. He says, I was all set to just go in there and sit in the back of the room. And Pastor Harmon said, you're on, here's a video. Show it if you have to. I have to go. I have a court date. I've been arrested for uh, being a part of pro-life. And he, he said, that was my introduction to Pastor Harmon as a student teacher. And he said... From there on, I learned about all kinds of things, and he proceeded to be unbelievably complimentary, which I thank God for. And I'm not trying to toot a horn as much as I'm trying to say, you just never know. Because the truth is, I remember him as a student teacher. I have fond memories of who he is, and I appreciated uh, his brilliance. He eventually became a teacher at Milwaukee Lutheran for, I think, about five years. Was that about right, Paul? And uh, just a you know, good job for us. And yet at the same time, the stuff he wrote, I just went, wow, Lord, I guess he did learn something from me. Uh, because you just don't know. And so you're teaching more than you realize. How you react, how you respond, 
what you do with your money, how you talk about the pastor, the teacher, the friend, the husband, the wife, the son, the daughter. It all matters. I was over preaching at Lake Country, and I looked at the kids. I go, raise your hand if you're an accident. Or you're the runt. Or the little one. Or the snottiest one in the family. Or the brilliant one. Or favored one. I went through this kind of a list over there at Lake Country. And I said, no, no, don't really raise your hand. But we talked about how we get labels. And how we get names attached to us. And how sometimes those names stick. And we have to realize What parents say about us and to us matters. What that pastor said to me as a five-year-old kid mattered. And it mattered to my mother. And it gave me permission. That was my first taste of being a Baptist. It gave me permission to shout out the amens. Okay, thank you very much. (laughs) And you begin to understand. God has got this work that he wants from you. That he needs from you. There are people that are watching and listening, children that are hearing what you say or you don't say, watching how you stomp or don't stop into church, smile or don't smile, help someone or don't help someone, look at kids or don't look at kids, treat them like they matter or treat them like they don't matter. I could just as easily have been wounded if the pastor would have just said, you better keep that kid quiet. Do you understand the power of those moments? And every once in a while, you get to hear the blessing of that. So my encouragement is you to understand you're fighting a beautiful fight. That's what the word good means there. It's it's a very special word for good. It means beautiful. And it's tough. And it's bloody. And it's really difficult. But it's a beautiful fight. Why? You're fighting for the life of a child for the life of a mother, for the health of a nation, for that which is needed in a country, a culture, in a situation. You've been called to fight that good fight. And like Paul, the invitation is, one day, the hope is that you'll be able to say, I fought the good fight. I'm ready to be poured out as you wish, Lord. And you also need to understand It doesn't matter how old or young you are. I shared with the kids how precious they are in God's sight. And I want you to understand, if God hasn't taken you yet, he doesn't want you yet. It's not complicated. There's more for you to do. And you begin to recognize that's what Paul was understanding. My job is over. I I can see it. I I stayed between the lines. I finished this race. I completed what I had to complete. And I am ready. Let God take me. It's all right. But also, the same thing as he said, I have continued to fight until the job was done. The place was over. And so that passage that addresses, I am addressing future generations. I'm standing in the gap for the next child whose mother may have to make an unbelievably difficult decision, but with the help of Connie in that ministry, they may make a decision for saving a baby that may make all the difference in the world. And so you and I have this privilege of participating in the way that God has set before you, in the path that he has for you, and recognizing the unbelievable ability for you to bless and change the world in and around you. Pray with me if you would. Lord, uh, when you call us, we sometimes forget the ministry that you're calling us to, the witnessing of people that you give to us, and uh, the privilege of loving kids and, and making a difference in a woman's life and a, a man's life and situations. And it doesn't matter how young or old we are, that a comment, a, an amen, a shout from the congregation, a blessing that somehow communicates that uh, we're with you, Lord, and we want to follow you wholeheartedly. In the middle of all of that, Lord, we thank you. And so we pray today that there would be a heart in each one of us that would burn with the kind of fire that Paul had to finish his race. We pray for eyes that would see the flags for the path in front of us 
so we understand while we each are going to be in a different part of the trail, we each have to follow where you're calling us to walk or to run or to stand or to fight or whatever you're calling us to do, Lord. Help us to understand that you uh, see us without age. You see us with an ability that is beyond our comprehension. And you call us into places to fight and stand to accomplish your purposes. Use this, Lord, to make a difference in our world. And we pray for the kind of determination and toughness that we need to press forward. Come and bless each of us, Lord. We pray it all in your name. Amen.